All right. I think we've left a, a couple minutes for those to uh, keep coming, those in the audience to keep coming in. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm very excited to have with us uh, Dr. Arash Azizi to talk about his book, Women, What what Iranians Want, Women, Life, Freedom, which I, I have right here. For those of you who may be new to the project, uh, the goal of the Iran 1400 project is to encourage healthy and productive conversations that make a constructive contribution to understanding Iran. Uh, we are confident that today's discussion will significantly add to this mission by promoting an exploration, by prompting an exploration of Iran's history and evolution and aiding in a better grasp of its future direction. Uh, like I said, we'll be talking about what Iranians want, women, life, freedom. Uh, Dr. Azizi, on behalf of the advisory board and the team at the Iran 1400 Project, we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. The Iran 1400 Project's mission is to foster a greater understanding of Iran's history during the past century specifically in order to promote an informed conversation about Iran's future. Your book's insightful observations and analysis of the women life freedom movement and its effects in Iran will certainly contribute to that mission. It is a great privilege to have you here today and to benefit from your expertise. Uh, and with that... Uh, Dr. Arash Azizi is a senior lecturer in history and political science at Clemson University. Uh, his new book has not been released yet, uh, but will be published in January 2024. Uh, and we are very, very excited to talk with him today. Uh, Dr. Azizi will talk about his book for around half an hour, and y'all can send questions in during that time if you'd like. Uh, and following uh, this talk, we will then have about 30 minutes to get into those questions. You can submit those questions into the Zoom chat, or you can email your questions at media at iran1400.org. Uh, and with that being said, Dr. Azizi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I uh, thank you, Sydney, and thank you, Iran 1400, uh, for uh, for inviting me to talk about the book. Um you know, I'll try to talk a, a little bit about the book, uh, as you mentioned, for about sort of half an hour. And as part of that, maybe I'll read, uh, maybe I'll read some of it as well, so that it's, you know, it's not just me talking about it, uh, and people have kind of have an idea as to what kind of a book it is. You know, so um, let me start by saying that, um, you know, when I was first asked to uh, to write a book about the movement that was going on in Iran and and had inspired many people around the world, the Women Life Freedom Movement, um, I was asked to write a book about it. Um, and and the, the, you know there was a question as to what kind of a book one could write about a movement uh, that is sort of ongoing um, and a movement that was focused on the street protests very much at that point. Uh, what kind of book you write about? It? If you really if you look at sort of reporting that is done um, um, on, on these kind of uh, movements, um, you often find yourself sort of lacking and asking questions because there is, um, you know. There's a lot of stuff that is happening on the street, but there's so much that you can glance from understanding uh, sort of a protest movement on the street. Uh, people come out, they're suppressed, they, they have to go back, you know, they'll they'll come back in and they're suppressed again. I've seen that in many movements around the world. Um, so what kind of approach you can take to it? Um, now, as a historian, one obvious thing for me would be to take a historical approach and, and tell the story of how is it that we got to this moment. 
Um, but there is a, you know, there's sort of a, a, a problematic uh, that emerges there, which is that, well, you know, what what have you really done if you just uh, give a history of, of Iran or the sort of political state of the country and its social movements right before, uh, you know, from the beginning, uh, right before then. In fact, to to say sort of provoca provocatively, uh, you can ask the question: Well, what difference does it make? Then you can write a you can write a history. Even if the movement hadn't happened, you can tell the story of this happened and then that happened, and uh, you know you kind of have a lead up to it. So um, while of course uh, I think framing and context contextualization, putting it in a longer pedigree uh, is important. It also felt to me not a book that this revolution deserved. Um, and after all, this was a revolutionary movement um, that was seriously challenging uh, the, the Islamic Republic. So I tried to do something slightly bolder, something of um, of a political manifesto, which is how I see this book. Um, and you know, the, the title uh, "What Iranians Want" really comes uh, comes from there. That it was an attempt for me to capture the demands of um, Iranians, of my my fellow Iranians, my compatriots, um, who, you know, I'm born in 1988. So this is very much my generation and afterwards. Uh, we were, I was born in the first decade of the revolutionary Iran, Islamic Republic of Iran, um, while in the last months of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, my uh, mother, like many, like, Many women who were pregnant during that era I spent much of her pregnancy in the bomb shelters as Saddam Hussein was raining bombs in Iran. So it was a really different era that we were, I was born in, and a different era that I that I grew up in, um, as I'll as I'll talk about uh, today a bit. So I tried to write a book that could really capture the uh, the kind of demands, uh, as I said, that the Iranians of my generations and after were making. What kind of a different Iran did they want? It? Why did they come out time and time again? To get killed in these protests um, and, and continuing protesting against the Islamic Republic. And I thought cookie cutter answers uh, such as, uh, you know, they want democracy or they want freedom or they want uh, liberal rights. While, while all of them might be true, um, they, they don't quite capture um, the diversity of, of the movements in Iran. Um, the kind of color of their demands, if you will. And if you look, there's Iran, there's tons of writing about Iran always in, in, in the Western press. Um, but the headlines, when you think about Iran, the, the main headlines are usually about its leadership, about the nuclear program and sort of nuclear crisis that we had, um, um, about the Iranian uh, state support for uh, for various movements um, in the region, sort of various armed groups in the region, which was very much a focus of my own first book also. But here I really tried to, instead of talking about the Islamic Republic and how bad it is and, and what terrible things it, it does, I tried to instead look at the Iranian society and at its various movements. And as I said, uh, very much uh, try to, you know, this is what I call it, a manifesto of not just describe what they're saying, but sort of advocate uh, on their behalf and speak about, you know, why, why is it that we Iranians care about this, this particular things. Um, and the anthem of the movement, if you remember, a song that very quickly became some sort of an anthem to the movement um, uh, of the Women Life Freedom Movement was a song by Sherbin Hajipur called Baraye, which later on, uh, you know, won him a Grammy, uh, which had been uh, out, uh, which which had been sort of crowdsourced on the basis of tweets. Uh, at some point, there, this trend started when people would use the hashtag Baraye and for which means for the sake of. And they try to basically say, why are they out? Why are they coming out to the streets? Um, because when in mass movements, this question always always arises. And why are people uh, out here? Especially when you don't have, unfortunately, you don't have a, a organized uh, voice that can speak on behalf of the people. I should make it clear, as I've said many times before, and I'll say at the end of this interview, I consider this a terrible thing, by the way. The fact that movement doesn't have organized politics and organized leadership is not a virtue at all. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, again, to, to stay strongly, I think it's actually shameful uh, that some people uh, stop said this was a sort of virtue and even sort of um, promoted it as some sort of a good thing. I, I definitely don't think it's a good thing. Um, and I think, you know, any movement for success would need organization and leadership. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the reality of it is that because of because of this, there I thought there was a need to um, give voice to these particular demands and talk about it. 
So, um, so this is what this is what the book is, uh, uh, and it each of its chapters um, has a you know it's dedicated to the fight for uh, one of the sort of central demands and central movements. And I, I because the Women Life Freedom Movement, of course, had started. Uh, when um, Mahsa Amini, a young a Kurdish Iranian girl, Mahsa Jina Amini, was uh, killed in custody while she was held up for her uh, improper hijab, basically that she hadn't uh, supposedly she hadn't covered her hair as the as as the regulations in Iran said, and she was killed in custody. Um, so the fight for against compulsory hijab was it's a subject of the first uh, chapter of my book. Um, which was very inspired by uh, Negar Motahede's uh, brilliant uh, book, Whisper Tapes, which is um, uh, really about this, you know, it, it, it's about uh, the first International Women's Day demonstrations in Iran after the revolution, March 8, uh, 1979. Um, and and which, which, as I said, is very much the inspiration behind the first uh, chapter of the book. And there's something really you know, narrative wise, there's something really sort of fascinating happening here. So uh, the fight against compulsory hijab had in 2022 and 2023 had culminated in the largest uh, and most serious challenge to the Islamic Republic for decades. Um, but in fact, this fight had uh, had begun before even the Islamic Republic was founded. So the Islamic Republic officially is, is founded in April. The revolution is in February, but the, the Republic is officially founded in April. So in March 8th, uh, before the revolution uh, has, before the even the republic has been officially founded, women come out in massive numbers to uh, to fight against the imposition of the compulsory hijab. Um, and effectively, even though they actually score immediate victory as that they sort of postpone the compulsory hijab, effectively no one in the political um, spectrum um, takes them seriously and their demands seriously. None of the political organizations, and I talk about in in the book of the very few organizations that are supportive. Um, but you know, none of the major or minor political organizations take them serious. So there's this something uh, interesting about this this narrative that um, the people who women had come out from day one to uh, to make sure that the liberatory demands of the revolution, many of them had fought for, will be taken seriously, and they had been the first one to stand up to the Islamic Republic as it established as it went on to establish this its dictatorship. Um, and uh, you know, forty years later, it was them again that had ignited this movement. So that's that's the first chapter. But then the various chapters go through different uh, movements. The second chapter is about women's rights, and uh, you know, not just against compulsory hijab, but about the modern feminist movement in Iran. Mm -hmm. And here, I started looking when I started to look into various uh, social movements that you could you know, connect people's demands. So it was the women's rights, labor rights, the environmental movement, uh, the freedom of expression. Um, a, a, a common trend emerged um, uh, that I thought would tell us something uh, fascinating about com uh, contemporary Iran, which was that, uh, you know, this movement hadn't started uh, two years ago. Uh, and if you if you hear a common narrative that, that I sort of don't like about uh, the Islamic Republic, the common narrative is that um, you know, so there was this terrible dictatorship that is established, um, and that people have always been uh, fighting against it, um, and and then the, sort of they emerge in in mass movements, and at some point they were you know fooled into voting for some reformist candidates, and and now they sort of found an awakening, um, and you know and and came out in mass movements and uh, like the Women Life Freedom Movement. The reason I didn't quite like this analysis is that it doesn't do justice to the very uh, alive history um, of the last uh, uh, 20 years, of the last two decades, um, and in fact, about three decades. So um, Mohammad Khatami was elected president of Iran in 1997 as, as, as a reformist president, and that's sort of the political history that we usually hear. But in this book, in every chapter, if you whether it's a chapter about the women's rights movement, the sort of modern feminist movement, as I said, whether it's a chapter about labor rights, whether it's a chapter about um, freedom for sort of um, uh, freedom of expression, uh, freedom for religious minorities, you see a trend emerges, which is that actually it wasn't just that Khatami was elected president in 1997, but what happened was that with, with his election, a period of 
um, opportunity emerged for civil society to be able to be active, um, which very much had something to do with how he have surprisingly had been pushed to power. But you know, I wasn't so much interested in machinations of of power at that point um, inside uh, the regime, which has been covered well in in other works. What I tried to do instead is to look at uh, sort of write, if you will, a history from below of of this various social movements and how they use these moments in late nineties and early two thousands um, to come to themselves and and find an organization and how they are then crushed under Ahmadinejad and how they. Uh, continue to come out. So even though the movements in 2017, 2018, these are mass street movements against the regime, um, they're sometimes covered as if they sort of came from nowhere um, or they're covered in this, I don't know, one dimensional way in which there is the, the regime and 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 the movement. Um, I thought it's more interesting to look at the, the history of cultivation of this um, uh, civil society organizations um, that, of course, had roots in deep Iranian history. You could always go back to the Iranian constitutional revolution at the beginning of the 20th century, 1905, and look at all the movements and how they had happened, how they had um, during the uh, oil nationalization uh, movement under Prime Minister Mossadegh in the 1950s, um, you know, how then they had opposed the post-coup, post-1953 coup, post -1953 coup um, uh, tyrannical government of the, of the Shah. And, and you know, you, you could have a longer history of social movements in Iran like that. But for the for the last uh, twenty years, they had had to find in the air, late nineties and early two thousand, they had sort of had to start from scratch because of the terrible repression of the eighties and how uh, everything had been snuffed out effectively in in the nineteen eighties by the Islamic Republic in its first sort of very bloody decade. Um, so as a result, I think each chapter uh, has ended up being uh, both a a potted history of. Um, of this resurgence of social movements in Iran of, of the last 20 years, um, and also, a, as I said, an advocacy of their demands. So I hope that when someone reads their book, they can get a clearer image of, of why Iranians are, are coming out and, and fighting, and in what, you know, in what exact color, as I said, um, because it's easy to um, have a generic image, but, um, you know, about democracy or, 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 or rights, uh, whereas when you get into the specific things, get more interesting. And of course, it's also interesting because Iranians don't fit very well um, some general narratives. They don't always fit. Um, they don't always ask for the exact things that they're sort of supposed to ask according to a, a global narrative of rights. Um, um, and, and I think you see this in each chapter. So as I said, the second chapter is about the women's rights movement, um, which had been a big sort of inspiration for myself again growing up. And, you know, this is not, when I say big inspiration, you know, it's not some sort of a general, of, uh, you know, it's not sort of a generic uh, thing to say, because um, if you were born like I was in, in 18, 1988, um, which means that you came of activism in your late teenage years in, in the mid noughties, um, that's when the women's movement was at the forefront of, of, of uh, you know, this is where you gathered if you wanted to uh, read good books, if, uh, you would go to this sort of feminist publication houses, demonstrations uh, were often led by women's organizations. So, um, uh, you know, they, they really, women's organizations had a, had a really central role and their resurgence could be rooted back to this uh, late 90s. Um, and sort of, I tried to capture them. The other chapters are, about there, there's a chapter. So I'll I'll name some of the chapters um, one by one, and then get to my last chapter, which I think um, you know, which I think is a good way of trying to wrap up thinking about the uh, the movement as a whole. So the next chapter is about the labor rights, the trade union movement that has a long pedigree in Iranian history. Of course, socialist and communist movements in Iran have long helped organize uh, trade unions, but in this, um, it's some of the veterans of the same sort of left movement that help bring back uh, uh, trade unions in the late 90s and how, um, you know, how they started to play an important role in Iranian society and, and also in what ways they they have failed. Um, um, also, this book as a whole, uh, it, you know, it's not a sort of a, a rose tinted glass book. It's very much sort of I try to be critical. Um, uh, the environmental movement, uh, which again has sort of mass proportions in Iran. And the, then there's a chapter on freedom of expression about all the artists and writers who have uh, in Iran have faced more than repression. As you know, we are now in the 25th anniversary of the chain murders, how in the um, 25th anniversary of the exposition of the chain murders, I should say. So in 1997, um, around this time, 
um, a few writers and, and political activists were killed brutally in their home. And it turned out that this was a culmination of a campaign that had gone on for a decade in which the Islamic Republic's intelligence forces had killed um, dozens of Iranian uh, writers and intellectuals in Iran and, and abroad. Um, and, and then so I'll have a chapter about religious minorities. Uh, I spe specifically focus on, on sort of Sunnis and Baha'is um, as, again, two religious minorities who are, are pretty different from one another. But um, what they have in common was that their, their fight for rights for all and, and not just for themselves um, had become, I thought, an important feature of, of the movement. Um, then I have a chapter on refugee rights that I think it's very important and it's more controversial, I have to say. Uh, what do I mean by controversial is that Iran, like any other society, has many anti-refugee uh, sentiments in it as well. But we saw that at the height of the Women Life Freedom Movement, um, pr uh, support for the rights of Afghan refugees and migrants in Iran was, was quite high. And there were Afghan uh, migrants who were killed while protesting for the Women Life Freedom Movement. So it created a new moment of solidarity, especially because the return of uh, Taliban to power in Afghanistan also happened uh, around the same time. Um, and I have a chapter on foreign policy. I'll show how uh, what I call the Iranians a struggle for peace, a fight for peace, that how Iranians are fighting for a peaceful foreign policy, that they're not happy with regimes, um, uh, regime's foreign policy of uh, you know, enmity with the world as they see it. Uh, and and it's sort of an interesting case here because I think this is also often misunderstood. Um, you know, the, the the Iranian movement's desire is not that it sort of, it wants Iran to be pro-Western necessarily. It just wants Iran to be an independent country that uh, that puts its uh, the interest of its citizens first, but also that, you know, that that's not looking to uh, have fights around the world. Um, as people, citizens of most countries are, are not very glad when their country does that, especially when it doesn't seem to bring any benefit for them and and it doesn't seem to be um, on the side of something good or, or just that they can support. Um, so there's a chapter on that. So as you see, the chapters as a whole try to capture uh, this diversity of, of social movements in Iran. And the last chapter that I'll talk a little bit about and um, also read a little bit uh, uh, from, from you guys, um, is uh, is a chapter called uh, Sarina's Revolution, the Fight for a Normal Life. Now, this is a quite a striking slogan that has appeared in Iran in recent years, the fight for a normal life. Why would you make a revolution uh, for a normal life? It's it's quite a striking. What does it even mean for a life to be normal anyways? Um, and, you know, I cut Sarina's Revolution because I look at the YouTube and other social media productions of a young Iranian teenager, Sarina Ismail Zadeh, who was killed in the movement in Erdogan. And I thought it's a perfect uh, channel, if you will, to the demands of these people who were even younger than me, right? So um, the sort of next generation who were very keen in this movement um, and who really risked their lives uh, coming out for it. And the question of why would be answered if you really look at um, at this young woman's um, uh, recollections um, and, and sort of productions that, as to the way she looked at the world, uh, which, by the way, you can also say that, of course, like any other teenager, it can be pretty, pretty naive uh, in, in some ways about the world. Um, but nevertheless, in her words, I thought we see sentiments that I could identify with and many Iranians of, of all uh, sort of of various social classes uh, and of various generations, those who have grown up under the Islamic Republic could identify with. Um, and so what is a, you know, what is a normal life? It, it is, um, it is in a way a, an attempt to live free from the very arbitrary constraints that Islamic Republic has put on life. Because you see, the struggle in Iran is not just for democracy. Iranians haven't had a democratic government uh, since definitely 1953, and even before that, they had it for a relatively short period. Um, but but, but in the, after the Islamic Republic has established its rule in the, in the early 1980s, they've lived under something worse than just a dictatorship, which is a sort of a very arbitrary dictatorship, as I said, that, uh, that imposes a lot of arbitrary rules on them, um, that you, you will be hard to struggle, you will be hard uh, pressed to find anywhere else in the world. Um, you know, in the issue of women's rights, this becomes very clear. The long list of uh, restrictions on women, um, and, and particularly young women, are not to be found anywhere else in the world. Um, uh, you know, certainly not, not, not in the same number. 
um, and and um, you know sort of all all together. Um, so this is striking a slogan really showed that, uh, and I've talked about this in my my other work of how uh, if in 1979 in the height of the sort of global 60s Iranians wanted a revolutionary movement that would that would change everything to, to use the good Arabic Persian uh, expression they wanted to. to to kun fayakun, right? They wanted to turn everything upside down. Here, perhaps paradoxically, um, they, uh, in order to have a very, uh, uh, what they call a normal life, they needed a revolutionary movement, which reminds me of, of a quote by James Connolly, the Irish um, socialist Marxist that I use in the book, which says, our demands are the most moderate. We only want the earth. Um, that this, the struggle for a normal life meant that they needed to actually ch challenge uh, the, the entire established order. So let me finish by reading uh, a little bit from the uh, last chapter um, of my book. There's also an epilogue um, uh, in which I discuss something that I broached here as well, which is to say that, um, of course, any movement would need leadership. And I try to speak about some of the uh, problems um, of why the movement has gone on defeat and, and what could be uh, what could be a little different. Uh, although I should add that the question of where can this leadership come from is partly um, in the uh, all the characters that I describe in this book. That Iran's very active civil society, even though it's pummeled to um, pummeled and suppressed uh, since around 2005 to this day, um, it still does exist, um, and we can see it in Nagas Mohammadi, who just won the Nobel Peace Prize, and all the other brave Iranian men and women who are often in prison, but who definitely. Um, represent an alternative Iran. So let me, in the last, uh, I think I have about seven minutes uh, left, let me read uh, something of my chapter nine, which I hope would be of interest to you. Um, okay. Over 500 people died in the 2022 Iran protests is a shocking true headline, but it's an alienating one, compressing many individuals into one sensational number. No one came out on the streets to die. No one dreamt of heroic martyrdom. All they wanted was a country where they could live freely. Many continue to chant, say their name, but what, what, what lies behind the name? A photograph, the few sentences that make it into a clip news report. Who are Iran's protesters really? In the last week of September, 2022, one death after another was confirmed on the news. Iranians hungered for more information about those who paid the ultimate price for voicing the demands of the nation. Who was Fuad Qadimi, a father of two in Divan Darre Kurdistan, who was shot in the stomach on 21st of September and died two days later in Sanandaj? The reports told us he owned the laundry and people from his town remembered him as Wiri. Who was Nika Shah Karami, a 17-year-old girl who had disappeared on 22nd of September only for her body to show up in a morgue a week later? We learned she was an ethnic lore born in Luristan. We knew she loved painting, studied in an art high school, and worked in a cafe. We knew her parents, like millions of Iranians, had moved in search of a better life to Karaj, the giant feeder town to the west of Tehran. What of the 23-year-old Hadith Najafi killed in Karaj on 23rd of September? We knew she had a degree in textile design, but like most Iranian graduates, could not find a job in her field. She worked as a cashier in a restaurant. Videos leaked soon after her death, showing her singing long, singing along to Surai Skanderle, an Azerbaijan-born Turkish pop star. Beat and pieces, fragments. This was all we had to go on to piece a picture together of their lives, their personalities, their aspirations. The regime wasn't keen on us knowing more than that, running a massive campaign of misinformation. They weren't protesters, the regime claimed, but people who had fallen from a roof or been killed by unidentified gunmen. It intimidated families and warned them of severe reprisals if they dared to tell the media the truth about their loved ones. Only the bravest overcame such fears. Hadith's sister, Afsun Najafi, spoke to the Prague-based Radio Farda to confirm that her sister had told her family she was joining the protest and had been killed. But even the sympathetic media, often based abroad, cared much more about protesters' deaths than their lives before September 2022. Who were these young men and women whose courage astonished the world? Why were teenagers putting their lives on the line to speak up against this brutal regime? More importantly, what did they want? What sort of Iran were they after? If you want to understand the new brewing revolution in Iran, you have to find a way of answering these questions. Revolutions are usually analyzed by looking at their intellectuals, grafting ideology onto a mass movement. 
We pour over Thomas Paine to grasp the American Revolution, grapple with Voltaire and Rousseau to understand the French Revolution, read Franz Fanon to come to terms with the Algerian Revolution. But ideologues don't make revolutions. Ordinary people do. Writing about the Russian Revolution, Leon Trotsky stated, the most indubitable feature of a revolution is the direct interference of the masses in historical events. The history of a revolution is for us, first of all, a history of the forcible entrance of masses into the realm of rulership over their own destiny. But ordinary people don't frequently write poems. They leave little in the written record for journalists and later historians to scrutinize. How do we uncover the motivations and ideas of the many thousands who came out to make history, including the few who sacrificed their lives for it? As the world attempted to understand the new Iranian revolution of 2002-2023, many pundits came with ready-made answers, comparing the movement to the 1979 revolution or the 2011 Arab Spring. If you watched Prime TV experts in the West, you could be forgiven for thinking you were watching a rerun of some previous protest wave. So few sought to understand the new Iranian movement. But if the new Iranian revolution so far lacks its own, the rights of man, it has something perhaps even more powerful, the thoughts of a teenage girl who gave her life for the cause of woman life freedom. Her joy, her anger, and her desire to live stand as a manifesto in their own right. Sarina Ismailzadeh was 16 years old when on 23rd of September 2022, the Islamic Republic's security forces beat her to death under a rain of bat batons. Like thousands of people who came out all over Iran that day, she had joined the protests following the death of Mahsa Amini. The protests marched through Karaj's Mehshar neighborhood, famed for the Pearl Palace, a former Pahlavi residence shaped like a batoid fish. It was on the same night, somewhere in the streets of the same neighborhood, that Haris Najafi met her death too. Sarina might have also been one of the many whose lives were reduced to a name, a few pictures, and a handful of biographical facts. From the news reports, we knew which high school she went to. We knew her father passed away in 2013. We knew she was living with her brother and her severely sick mother. But Sarina had left behind more than others. Like many of her fellow Gen Z Iranians, she was an avid user of social media platforms. On them, she documented the vicissitudes of adolescence, her hopes and anxieties for the future and her daily routine. These posts were her public diary, a place to tell her a story of growing up in a country where so much of basic life could be forgiven, forbidden. Although they were created months before the protests kicked off, although they were often not political in nature, Sarina's reflections elucidate why so many of her generation are willing to risk their lives for, for change. The multi-talented Sarina wrote poetry, made videos, drew impressively, and loved dancing and curating music. In January 2022, a few months before her 16th birthday, she created a YouTube channel. In the channel's description, you could already hear her fun and eager voice. Hey, hey, I'm still at the beginning, so I can't say I'm a blogger yet. But here I am anyways. Oh, before I forget, for the love of God, please subscribe. In April... Just as a new Iranian calendar year was starting, she opened the channel on Telegram, a messaging and social media are popular in Iran, to share her writings. Her first post consisted of grumbling about her aunt and two pictures of her with a mask on, a reminder of the COVID-19 pandemic that had ripped through Iran. In May, she started posting her vlogs on YouTube. In August, she launched three new channels on Telegram, one for quotes, one for images, and one for music. Between the five channels across Telegram and YouTube, her creativity shone through illuminating both the delights and difficulties of Iranian teenagerhood. Sarina was unique. She had no intention of being the voice of a generation, but anyone who knows Iranian teenagers instantly recognizes a few shared traits. For myself, she was... For myself, her way of speaking and her interest reminded me of my two cousins in Tehran. She has spoken the same annoyingly English afflicted Persian She spoke in the same annoyingly English afflicted Persian, starting her videos with a long guys in English. She listened to the same Persian rap and Western alternative rock songs. She was so consciously cool, especially compared to the teens of my generation. Her dreams and the obstacle to them resonated with me. I'll read just one more paragraph and I'll stop there. The most, the most basic facts about past and present of women who live in Muslim-majority countries have long been subject to political manipulation, 
borrowed as tropes to score this or that point in Washington, D.C., or in the ivory towers of Western universities. Pictures of mini skirt wearing Iranian or Afghan women are instrumentalized to justify Western intervention in the Middle East by the hawks, while some nominally left-wing dove assert against all evidence that this woman constitute a privileged elite and the majority of Iranian women choose to live restrict restricted lives. These hackneyed pseudo-debates seem laughable from the perspective of a 16-year-old girl in Karaj in 2022. Uh, I think I'm over the time, so I'll uh, I'll stop here. Uh, that's all right. Thank you, Dr. Azizi, for that great presentation. Uh, really appreciate that insightful uh, analysis and look into your book. Uh, we have time now for questions. So for those in the audience, please send those questions in to the Q&A and uh, we will get to them. Uh, before we get into that, though, uh, I have some announcements on behalf of the Iran 1400 project. Uh, for those who have not really gotten a chance to to explore the project yet, we focus on the evolution of ideas and institutions in Iran over the past century. Uh, we have some already uh, a lot of content relevant to today's conversation. We you, you can find most of it on our YouTube page. Uh, there we have interviews with dozens of scholars of Iran about the women life freedom movement. Uh, that we recorded on the one-year anniversary of the movement, looking at the evolution there and what has changed in the past year. Uh, Dr. Azizi was one of the people who we interviewed, so you can find that on the Iran 1400 Project YouTube page. Uh, we also interviewed uh, Cameron Michael Amin, Haide Mokisi, Hoda Mahmoudi, Farzin Vahdat, Mona Tajali, Frida Afari, a lot of folks who you can go see on our YouTube channel. Um, and also, if you check out our website, Iran1400.org, we have content there in both English and Farsi about uh, ideas and institutions in Iran. Uh, we also have a podcast you can find at the Iran 1400 podcast. Uh, so please check that out. And if y'all would like to get involved or if y'all have any uh, suggestions, feel free to email us and let us know about that, uh, about those. And uh, you can also find us on social media at Iran1400 Project. So now uh, we can get into the Q&A segment. Uh, I'll start off with one question that we I've I've already asked Dr. Azizi for our YouTube channel, um, but just to to show sort of the the types of questions that we had there for the most recent interviews that we had on the woman life freedom movement. Um, Dr. Azizi, uh, considering the goals of the woman life freedom movement, what ideational or institutional transformations could be implemented in Iran uh, to enhance the effectiveness and progress towards those objectives? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, so you're at, the question is that considering the goals of the movement, um, I think what is it ideational? Uh, yeah. What, what? What? Because the Iran 1400 project focuses on ideas and institutions. Mm -hmm. What ideational transformations or institutional transformations could be implemented in Iran in order in order to further the goals of the movement? I mean, Iranians. Um, like like many others, uh, many other scholars, I do see the movement as a continuation, as I said, of Iranians' um, demand for um, um, for civic rights and liberty that goes back all the way to constitutional revolution of, of 1905. Um, and I think it's also a movement for some sort of a national sovereignty, which which might seem sort of paradoxical, but I don't think it is because I think Iranians. Um, like other people in the non sort of Western world and uh, since the early 20th century have tried hard to uh, sort of build the world on their own terms. Um, so this they've they've struggled for uh, to to build uh, to sort of grapple with modernity and 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 modern conditions and, and sort of what is doing to them and build the world in their own terms. So I think what they want um, are, um, in, in, you know, in, in some basic ways, yes, they want a liberal democracy, but, but you know, not 
not so much as an end, uh, as sort of as an end point, um, but as a beginning point. I, they want conditions in which they can elect their own representatives and uh, uh, try to then solve these uh, questions um, that Iran grapples with, of what kind of a country it wants to be and, and um, what kind of economy it wants to have and what sort of, you know, what kind of, um, how does it want to uh, manage relationship of its different parts with each other, they can do that um, in an, in um, you know, in, in without repression and 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 sort of in and in free conditions. And if you look at history, those brief periods where Iran did have something of an open space, so uh, Iran in, from about 1940s to 1953, and also in the early years of the revolution, actually from 79, I would say to 80, 81, you see really a flourishing of, of Iranians with a variety of different ideas um, who uh, who sort of come out and, and um, put their demands and, and they sort of publish and they speak out in, in a wide variety of formats. You have this, as I said, flourishing of, of intellectual and cultural and artistic uh, productions. Um, that have also gone on despite all the restrictions in 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 uh, you know all in the fa- past few decades. Right, the Iranian cinema, which is a uh, sort of thrill to the entire world, the Iranian arts and literature, they've, they've always gone on. So I basically, so in terms of ideas, I think yes, Iranians want um, Iranians want a uh, they want democratic conditions and they want a, a civic rights for everyone. Um, but this is also part of them trying to um, assert their national sovereignty and uh, uh, really uh, build their nation and the country that they they love. We all love so much uh, in their own terms. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from the audience. Uh, Dr. Negar Motahide says, amazing research uh, professor azizi thank you for your presentation of the book's contents i can't wait to read it uh so question part of the anthem for the movement boroye reflected on the environment and piruz uh the asiatic cheetah who sadly died early on in the movement how do you see these particulars in other words the state of the environment and the condition of native animals as part of the fight for a normal life in Iran. Thank you very much. It's it's really an honor to have Professor Motaide here. As I mentioned earlier in my talk, the first chapter was really inspired by her. But I mean, not just the first chapter. The first chapter is really inspired by her book. But um, you know, I've always learned so much from her, and it's it's, it's great to uh, to have her here. Um, it's also very interesting that uh, that she mentions uh, Piruz and the environment because perhaps one of my favorite chapters of the book, in fact, it starts with Piruz, and it is uh, about that environment. And I think this also really goes. It's one of the most um, perhaps unusual sections of the book because it makes, you know, you to have a mass movement about environment and to sort of die uh, on the path of it, uh, you know, doesn't happen every day. Um, and, but really this is one of the key issues in Iran. And in terms of Piruz, it's not just environment, but it's this, this, this animal, right? So this Asiatic cheetah or the Iranian cheetah, um, as, as they call it, who's going extinct and Iranians care so much about. It. And the life of this little cop Piruz was followed from the moment uh, he was born. Um, really, to the day he died, there were news reports about it every day, and and you know I think this really tells something beautiful and touching about um, um, about the movement, um, and and so so and how does this relate to the answer that I gave to your first question? You see, I think I think it really shows you because why what are Iranians so unhappy about? Of course, there is the climate change um, that is a global issue, and Iranians are also fighting against it, but they're also fighting against the sort of incompetence of a government. Who really doesn't seem to care about um, uh, Iran, and that's how they see it. Now, of course, um, this this is true of many other governments uh, in, in the world, right? That they're they're not they don't have a great environmental track record. But in this case, a sort of corruption and a sort of um, lack of basic uh, state competence has really come to characterize the Islamic Republic in the last couple of decades. You know, um, it's very different from even the. Islamic Republic in its early years was very, uh, uh, very repressive and sort of murderous, as I said, 
Um, but at least it seemed that people in charge had some sort of a revolutionary project that they were actually eager to follow, as opposed to recent years, where it seems to be that the main goal for many people um, is filling their own pockets, and, and even that is gone. So I think the fight for, I, I love the chapter on, on Peru's and, and the uh, love for the environment, because I think it shows uh, the dimension of um, movement that is fighting for against a state incompetence, it also shows you something of how this is, as I said, a movement for national resurgence and a national sovereignty, because you know, Iranians care about their environment um, and their country. And um, as 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 you know, and might be appear, might be uh, sort of obvious already to anyone that I am, I'm a person of, of the left. And, and in, you know, today, perhaps we don't usually think of patriotism or, or movements for national uh, resurgence as part of the left, but I think very much it, it you know it it can be of course. Now I'm not saying the movement Iran is 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 just leftist. It includes all sort of different spectrums, um, but I think it's um, I think it tells it it has definitely in my opinion a progressive dimension that people care about their lived environments and they care about their country, and they care about it is those terms. So they are really touched in an unbelievable way when they see the Asiatic cheetahs are are being destroyed when they see Urumia Lake. It's a beautiful salt lake in northwestern Iran that I went to as a kid is drying up. To see the Zion, the river in Esfahan, that is sort of the core of Iranian identity, um, is is becoming dried up. Um, so I think it really shows the, sort of a better side of the movement um, in many ways. Um, and I hope that that side can be actually a strength because, uh, you know, you need um, for a movement to be caring enough and humane enough to to care about the lives of animals and as as well. I think it says something uh, positive about it. Thank you, Dr. Azizi, for making that connection there. Uh, the next question, well, well, first, for those in the audience, we we still have time for some more questions. Um, so we've, we've got one more from the audience, but please do send more in. Uh, the next question is from Sanford Weiner. Uh, can all of these movements change the government uh, other than make marginal changes. How can this theocratic authoritarian government be made to change? Force, or how can the people accomplish what they really want? Uh, yes, I, uh, you know, I do believe it's force. Um, I like to, you know, when I, I teach world history uh, in university and I, every couple of days, you know, I sort of like to tell my students, you know, as you see, force is what changes human history. Um, and I, I believe in that. Of course, it depends what we mean by force, but I do mean, I mean, material force, right? That, um, and I think, um, so how can the change be made? I mean, the the tragic uh, reality as is that Iranians have failed to, um, to bring together their various movements to offer an organized political alternative to the regime. Um, and there's no two ways about it. We can't be, uh, it's it's a case of failure. Um, now, some of these failures, much of it, in fact, is self-inflicted in some ways. Um, I, should, I should start by saying that, of course, any sort of political organization in Iran um, is very difficult because the government so heavily represses everyone. And I really mean everyone. For example, think about association of Iranian writers. You know, um, you can't get, uh, you know, Association of Iranian Writers is, it's, it's you know, a bunch of writers and writers are not known usually for, for um, um, themselves to have a great uh, sort of revolutionary potential necessarily. But not, not only this association is suppressed for, for many years, they haven't been allowed to, to meet. Um, you know, if 40 members of the association plan to meet, uh, you know, for somebody's wedding, um, the government finds out and arrests them. Um, which is why there had been raids on these weddings and stuff. So it's incredibly difficult to do any sort of organization in Iran, and it's not for the lack of um, it's not for the lack of effort. So the Iranian prisons are filled with uh, women's rights activists, trade unionists, um, uh, writers, uh, environmental activists, those who are, to, who are fighting uh, to organize. But nevertheless, uh, when you fight against a dictatorship like the the, the Islamic Republic, um, obviously. You know that's that's how it is. You you must be able to go beyond these restrictions, and I think part of the reason why they haven't been able to do that, um, and definitely includes those outside Iran who don't face such restrictions, and have also failed to put together even the most rudimentary organization. Part of it is self-inflicted. I think, unfortunately, for the past couple of decades, this pernicious idea that you political parties and organizations are a thing of the past, that you don't need them anymore, that you can now make uh, revolutions on Twitter. 
that you can now, uh, you don't need leaders anymore. And that's, you know, ideologies are passe and people can just sort of uh, go gather up in a square and 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 they'll they'll make a change. And I, there is an excellent book by Vincent Bevins uh, recently, which is sort of goes through a lot of these movements in Ukraine, in Brazil, in other places, and, and sort of examines this, this problem. Um, and I'm, I've interviewed Mr. Bevins for for Iran Wire uh, in both English and Persian. That article is out. Uh, he he doesn't really talk about Iran, uh, but but I think his lessons are applicable. Um, so I think this this has been part of a problem. Um, and you know, so the question of what can be done is that you need a political movement that puts together a clear political alternative and a political leadership that is ready to rise up and fight and um, overthrow Khamenei. I mean, it's it's no joke. Um, and you cannot do that, do that if you're just a human rights activist. You cannot do that if you are just a activist that is, that's, you know, you cannot, in fact, you cannot do that if your primary identity is activist. Activists are great, but if you want to overthrow a regime in a country, if you want to make political change, you're going to need to have politicians. You need to, you need to have a political leadership. And unfortunately, um, we haven't been able to uh, build that. Um, uh, and, you know, you, you look at, successful examples in history when that happened, regardless of what you think about them. For example, the movement in Poland that I've been studying recently, that it's it's very, very inspiring to me. If you look at how um, Lech Walesa and the sort of trade union in, in Poland were, were able to organize and put together leadership. Now they got a lot of help from many forces around the world, including, you know, the, the Catholic Church, um, the American government and, and, and trade unions in America and Italy and other places. Um, but the important thing is that they were able to uh, offer a clear alternative. Um, and that alternative, most Iranians actually agree on what that alternative should be, which is a free elections um, for, you know, an Iran whose future will be determined on the basis of free elections and safeguarding of the country's territorial integrity. Um, you know, these are uh, these are demands that are really held by most uh, I mean, I can't say most Iranians, but certainly most proponents of change in Iran. Yet, um, to organize, to sort of solidify them into a political program um, and put an organization um, and leadership behind them has proved uh, very difficult. And that's something that um, in my epilogue, I try to discuss some of the possible scenarios. Because in the absence of Iranians doing that, um, then, of course, the history doesn't stop. Other forces will come and, and you know, um, I think the regime will go and will fundamentally change regardless, actually. And then I try to explain there why. Um, but if Iranians who want democracy, who want um, the kind of ideas that this book is about, if they want to make it happen, they have no way other than organizing and putting together um, an, a clear alternative. Great. Thank you. Uh, we still have time for a couple more questions. Uh, the next question is about the term using revolution for the the woman life freedom movement uh so what what factors exist that um could make a movement a revolutionary movement and what uh how does that pertain to the woman life freedom movement in, in particular yeah i mean it's it's hard to name a woman as as it's going on um um in the future, depending on how events go, I don't think the 2022-23 movement will be called a revolution. Revolutions become revolutions when they're successful, usually. I guess we use 1905 revolution in Russia, for example, even though it wasn't entirely successful, but it still made some changes. This movement um, has mostly gone undefeated. Um, we cannot pretend like it. this movement has changed nothing in Iran in terms of government structures. Now, there is civil disobedience. Masses of women continue to refuse to wear uh, the hijab. Uh, that's the sort of most important change that it has made in Iranian society. And it will have effects um, down the road. But if a movement is to be taken seriously by its main political goals, it has not made Iran more free. Um, and even the civil disobedience that women are showing is very, very fragile. Uh, I'm not sure it will be there in a year, frankly. I hope that it would be, but maybe it also wouldn't be because there's very serious attempt of the regime to, to crack down on it. Um, and I think we should take that seriously. No, but why is it that I call it a revolution movement and others called it? I think it's not it's not very hard to answer. Is that the the people had revolutionary demands, um, in which one of which was uh, this is not a protest. This is a revolution. I mean, it was a very common chant early on. Um, they want everything to, to change. I.e., they want this Islamic Republic to go, um, and they 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 don't want it anymore. Um, 
And the reason for that is that even the smallest changes, the smallest reforms have been made impossible by this regime. It's, it doesn't allow them. Um, it has that sort of the loyal opposition inside Iran is as severely repressed as everybody else, frankly. Um, the main reformist organizations that accept the Islamic Republic are banned, right? The organizations of President Khatami, the former president of Iran, who is very much an Islamist, very much in support of the Islamic Republic, was his image was banned for, for many years now. So when you make all reforms impossible, even demands for basic change will become revolutionary. Although I should say that Iranians have also shown in their political history to be incredibly pragmatic, right? So they're, you know, they, um, if there is an opening somewhere for reforms uh, anywhere, they will take it again. They they don't want a revolution just for the sake of it. Um, but that having made impossible, the regime has shown itself to be, to it has become an unrepresentative caste that rules over Iranian people that um, that is really not identified with by I would say 70, 80 percent of, of, of Iranians. Um, it has a core of supporters, but outside that, um, you know, they might like some of the things that the government has done at some point, right? Um, but they don't really identify with it, and that's why they they uh, wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so I imagine it's been a while since you finished the writing for this book. So I'm wondering what things have happened in between when you finished your 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 book and now that are worth noting or you wish you could have mentioned or even maybe elaborated further on in the book um i would say that um so i finished writing not that long ago actually so august right so it's about six months uh no less than six months even like four months um yeah this was a sort of a quick um mm -hmm. so, yeah about four months ago um but i would say the raisi government so this is the the president who's been there since 2021 where iran first it's first truly non-competitive elections in 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 decades now iranian elections have never been free and, under the islamic republic have never been free and fair but they were competitive i.e they allowed different wings of the regime to genuinely compete from about from 1997 to 2017 which was the last election that was competitive um and in 2021 it was no longer competitive like there were there were a few candidates but basically nobody from the reformist side um not no serious candidate from the reformist side could could run or even the centrist side sort of pro hassan rohani um a, a former central bank governor hemmati was allowed to run but you know none of the main figures in fact some of the main conservative figures were refused to run like ali larijani a very conservative traditional leadership of the Islamic Republic, he was refused to run. So I have to say about the Raisi government, um, if you asked me early on, I would have said that you might, in fact, and this might surprise some um, uh, some listeners, you might have, I thought that you might, in fact, try to see some increase in competence in, in, in some parts. This is because the government would be more, uh, you know, uh, it would be more unif uniform, right? So there, there would be less daylight between the regime and, and Raisi administration. Um, and that, uh, true to its promise, it tried to de-escalate ties of Iran with the region. So it was able to have Iran join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It was able to um, make an important peace deal with Saudi Arabia and re-establish re diplomatic ties, which I, in and of itself, I think is a good thing. Um, as I said, I want my country to not have fights with any country in the world, including Saudi Arabia um, and, and others, right? So... I want them to have normal di diplomatic ties. So on its face, that's a good thing. So you would think Raisi administration sort of perhaps paradoxically might be able to actually improve things in Iran a little bit in sort of a repressive way, but it hasn't done that. And in fact, the economy, Iranian economy is worse than ever. And you don't need to take my words for it. In fact, this if, if you look at the Iranian, I think one of the mistakes uh, many of uh, sort of observers of Iran make is that they don't look enough in the inter internal Iranian dynamics. Just because they're all supporters of Khamenei doesn't mean they don't have differences with each other. And if you look at inside Iranian conservative dynamics, you see that heavy fights now between the IRGC, the militia that undergirds the power of Khamenei, uh, between uh, various wings of, of the conservatives in Iran, so Ali Baf, the Speaker of the Majlis and Raisi's administration. So you would see basically that so what has happened, but has really become clear in the last few months is that the Raisi administration has not been able to um, to provide any betterment for the people and that there is the sort of the rotten. And, you know, I, I'm not the 
person who just says that. Like, just because I hate the regime, I would say is rotten from inside. You can be a terrible regime, but not be so rotten, right? Um, by which I mean, you know, you can be sort of very efficient, right? Um, there are many dictatorships that are very efficient, uh, but this is not the case in Iran. I, mean, I think the last few months have made it clear, and it, they've made it clear that the, when the Khamenei dies, when when, which is an inevitable fact that has to happen in the next, I don't know, uh, ten years maximum. I mean, Iran has hope for less. Um, you will see that all these differences will will show themselves, and the future of Iran will be thrown into uh, to question. Unfortunately, however, as I said, the sort of movements that I write about in this book. Um, are not necessarily very uh, well prepared for that moment. Um, although I, one would say that inside Iran, um, they're more prepared, more organized, and more in solidarity with each other than than many uh, many of their opponent, their proponents outside Iran, unfortunately, uh, who, given the free conditions outside Iran, have not been able to organize very well with each other. Inside Iran, I have more hopes for civil society inside Iran than I have for anyone uh, outside. Uh, but yeah, so I guess it would be um, it would be that. Great. Well, I think that that is a good note to end on. Thank you again for joining us today and presenting your book. Uh, those in the audience in January 2024, uh, What Iranians Want, Women, Life, Freedom, will be published with One World Publications. Uh, if you found today's event interesting please as i mentioned earlier check out our youtube channel we have a lot there about the women life freedom movement including uh about a 20 minute interview with dr azizi about the movement uh and during that interview he mentioned it frequently or he mentioned it briefly earlier about um iran's lack of a, a political or political parties and a wider uh political establishment in that regard he, he gets into that in our YouTube video. It's really interesting if y'all would like to see that. Uh, and then also, please stay tuned for our next Spotlighting an Author. It's January 19th with Katrin Nahidi. We'll be talking about her book, The Cultural Politics of Art in Iran, Modernism, Exhibitions, and Art Production. Uh, and other than that, please do look at our website and let us know what y'all think, what we're missing, what you'd like to see more of. And uh, Dr. Azizi, thank you again for being with us today. I We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for, thank you for having me.